All right, guys, welcome to the Fitter and Faster Coaches Corner on our Fitter and Faster webinar platform. I am your host, Mike Murray. We're here with another quarantine edition of the Coaches Corner. I'm coming at you live from the Green Mountains of Vermont. And today I am so excited to have the coaches from the DART program out in California. Before we get started with Billy and Brian, I want to remind our viewers that they are welcome to ask any questions using the chat box on the right. If you look at the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see that chat box. And at the end of the show, if we have time, we will try to get you to your questions. And I also want to point out that any spammers will be immediately removed from the webinar. Also, guys, if you stick around for the duration of the webinar, that means all the way through, I'm going to select a couple people uh, to win a free arena national team sweatshirt. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I will be choosing a person for that award. So with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our coaches today. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Billy Doty. Billy started with the DART program at Davis in 2009. Since that time, he's helped shape DART into a nationally respected and recognized program. Billy is also fresh off his head coaching gig with the USA Swimming Junior National Team, who competed last year in Budapest. In 2018, Billy was part of the DART program that contributed three athletes on the United States Swimming National Team. And in 2015, DART was awarded the USA Swimming Gold Medal Recognition status. Billy, you also have had the distinct pleasure of being my roommate in Colorado Springs at National Select Camp, which, which could possibly be your greatest accomplishment yet. But uh, welcome to the Coach's Corner. Well, thanks, Mike. I appreciate you having me. And uh, I'm surprised that uh, you're still around after uh, <laughs> having to deal with my snoring for multiple days at the OTC. So uh, congrats on that. I think that was the first thing that you mentioned to me when we, we were rooming together. The train uh, was coming. <laughs> I'm also thrilled to introduce my friend and other coach at DART, Brian Nabetta, who is the head coach of the DART program at Sacramento. Brian has years of experience coaching various levels of swimming from age group all the way through college swimming and masters. Brian has been an assistant coach at the NCAA level at Cal Berkeley, BYU, and San Jose State University and has has had multiple experiences as a USA Swimming Junior National Team coach, as well as heading up a variety of USA Swimming National Select Camps, Diversity Select Camp, and was named the NCSA Junior National Coach of the Year in 2017. Brian, I have been following your home workouts via Facebook uh, the last couple weeks. Uh, your garage gym looks both terrifying and intense. So can you, before we get started, can you tell us how you set that garage gym up and, and are you getting the whole family involved? Uh, the garage gym was, uh, always a work in progress. Um, I just needed to stay in shape when I wasn't a part of a gym. And as you can see behind me, I have a whole rig set up in my backyard. Um, my whole family, they're all uh, all about exercising. As Billy knows, uh, you know, my daughter, my son, my wife, uh, we like to stay fit, so, and we love to eat. So, you know, I, I get all, hey, I travel with Billy. I mean, I have, I have to stay fit if I, if I have to compete. And Billy's like, Brian, you got to try this. You got to, you got to, have you had this? And I'm like, no, but I'll try it. So, it's that, all good. That that gym looks awesome, man. I saw you got a, you got a blackboard and whiteboard up for writing the whole workout in. That's, that's pretty yeah. awesome. How long yeah, did it well, take you to get that whole thing set up? Uh, my whole gym, probably a good four to five years to, to get to where I wanted it to be. And then uh, I actually go to an actual CrossFit gym to work out. Um, my, uh, it, it, this pandemic probably just, solidified uh, exercising at home and I was glad I had the equipment um, seeing online what what how much the stuff costs that people are selling now to work out at home I don't think I could afford it so unbelievable it right out. yep unbelievable. It, it, is the home gym the genesis of any dryland ideas for what you guys do at dart um, for my program yes I mean I've, I've gone through the gamut of of uh, lots of dry land to a little bit of dry land to now I've been doing 
uh, I'm certified personal trainer. So I, I, I've been doing a lot of different experimenting for a lot of different kids and different groups of kids. So I've kind of narrowed the, the spectrum down to helping my athletes on a more of a sports specific basis. Sure. Sure. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, the, the question that we've been starting the coach's corner with here the last couple of weeks is uh, extraordinarily apropos with the times that we're in right now, these uncertain times. That's a phrase that I've, I've come to disdain over the past two months. Um, but during this quarantine, uh, I'd feel remiss if I didn't ask how you and Dart at both locations are handling this situation. And what are you guys doing to stay actively engaged with your swimmers and your families? And uh, Billy, I'm going to hit it off to you first. Yeah, Mike, we're doing the same thing. I think most teams are doing around the country of, you know, trying to come up with some sort of dry land component for, to keep them engaged and try to vary that from, you know, working out um, with whatever they have to, uh, to some sort of aerobic um, component. One of my assistant coaches has a, uh, to uh, sit to uh, a son and a daughter who both made uh, 2016 Olympic trials in uh, track and field. Um, and they're sending out stuff. Uh, yeah. On the, on the running, like how to progress from swimmers who don't know necessarily how to run and how to build into that part of it. Uh, but then even on the social dynamic, you know, doing things from scavenger hunts to uh, you know, we've created a, how do you know your coach and, and done that and sending out questions on, sign up geniuses with prizes to, you know, anything we can do to keep them engaged. The younger guys have done Netflix movie parties, um, you know, just anything we can to keep in touch at this point. Sure. How about you guys, Brian, over at the Sacramento site? Yeah, uh, no different than Billy. We've done, uh, got together with making a weekly schedule, Zoom meetings, uh, guest speakers, uh, writing out dry land, uh, as well as uh, probably handed out 20 uh, stretch cords. I have about 20 kids that have swim pools in their backyard. So they, uh, they, they started asking me to write out uh, some kick sets and stuff for them as they put in uh, a backyard, you know, stationary swimming. But other than that is uh, games, Kahoot, all those, uh, you know, just to keep them engaged, I think was uh, our main focus because uh, our uh, this this year was uh, our hashtag was one team, one family. And I think uh, it really has spread over to the Davis side as well, where I know my age group coaches are really close with uh, age group coaches at the Davis side, as well as myself and Billy. Um, so we've been trying to do a lot of different things and um, kind of coordinate certain age group stuff as well. Absolutely. I think I used to so look forward to guys taking my diving well and writing some tethered workouts. And now I'm run out of ideas, <laughs> you know? So I used to think, Oh, this is so outside the box for me. This is really cool. What can I do with our stretch cords? And now, you know, I'm trying all kinds of new modalities there, but uh, it's definitely something that I think we're all thinking about for us in New York state. Uh, as I've mentioned before, it, it's a real challenge. We're, we're really looking at open water now as the best way to get started. We've been out of the pool since March 15th. Um, so we're looking at the possibility of bringing in open water as the first part of our training. Um, to jump into our main topic, and I know that a lot of people are really excited about this because I think as an athlete, I used to get excited about test sets because it was such a great challenge. Um, we have a test set program or I have a test set program that a lot of people have talked about and it's kind of woven itself into our culture at Victor Swim Club. And it's a little representative of who we are, what we do, how we train. Is that something that happens at DART too? Has your test sets become part of the cultural experience of DART? Um, and Brian, I'll have you start on this one um, and then we'll move over to Billy. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm probably more of a traditionalist test set type of coach. I, uh, my mentors were Kim Mush, North Thornton, John Urbanchek, and, you know, most of the stuff that, that I've obtained throughout, throughout the years from the many coaches that I've been around, um, 
I, I test set color set, uh, uh, you know, 10, 300, uh, 3000 for time. I played around with, um, uh, even a time domain of 20 minute, 20 minute swim for distance. But, uh, when it comes to all out swims, I still do, uh, six, two hundreds, um, on eight minutes. I do eight, one hundreds on eight, uh, I record everything. Um, so, uh, in, in that aspect, I, I, I'm a traditionalist when it comes to, uh, test sets of the past. I think they have relevance to what I do now, but, um, uh, being merged with Billy, uh, in, uh, you know, in 2014, uh, I, I, I believe so hard, uh, wholeheartedly that, um, there's many ways to, to, to get what I want out of the test set. And that's even getting additional sets from coach Billy, um, that I can incorporate into my, uh, uh, results so that I can use those within my swimmers after I've seen the results of the test set. Sure. Absolutely. And, and Billy, yeah. do, do you find that the test sets that you have, the, the kids are, the kids are thinking about how important it is to their development in the program, that it's kind of a, a cultural anchoring point for them? I, I think for us, I'm a little different um, in the fact that and I'll, I'll kind of show that information later, but um, Ours, our test sets are really more about uh, where where you are today and uh, and and then and helping them see the progressions or even helping them see designs as to what they're trying to work on within their race. Um, and so I, I don't know they're part of our culture, but it, it it is important to them because I think it sets the at least sets a baseline for where we start um, and and allows them to see progression and, and the work they're putting in and and where they want to go within a season. So I think if they see the importance in it, it just isn't necessarily uh, something that they uh, are, is ingrained into the training culture, I guess. Sure. One, one thing that uh, we do at Victor that the kids really love, and it's kind of something that uh, is the ignition point for our test sets, and that's we blast ACDC every single time we have a test set. It never varies. It's always ACDC. It could be a little bit different song lineup, but it's always ACDC. But when Hell's Bells comes on and they're getting up on the blocks, it becomes a uniquely exciting environment. Uh, is, is there anything that you guys do for your test sets to get them fired up? You know, we're, we're outside, um, which is which is good and bad. And, and so certain times of the year, it's phenomenal. And, and we can have music outside and things like that. And then Certain times of the year, it might be 35 degrees with a, a sleeting, <laughs> misting, uh, windy rain. Um, so I think the consistent part of that is is not necessarily always the same. Uh, but there definitely is the the preamble to even what we do for warm up and, and prepping into what we're doing uh, of knowing like, hey, this is important today, and we're we need to think about this almost as a warm up prep for like we would for a meet, um, and to be ready to go at this certain time. Uh, so it's just sort of making sure that they understand the importance and the, and the prep in and what it takes to be ready to go fast. Sure. sure. Yeah, Brian, um, at, at Victor, we do we do the exact same pace warm up that we would do if we were at a meet right before we get into our test sets. Is that something that you guys do over at Sacramento? Or are you preparing them like it is a competition? Exactly. We're warming up. Um, in season, we probably do anywhere like, 3k to 3500 before we get going on a test set i sure. think uh i think uh warming them up uh letting them letting them uh after a general warm-up letting them go on their own for a little bit uh, just so that they get some individual attention to themselves on how to get themselves warmed up uh i do like i do play a lot of music at practice i do allow uh, uh, some screening of playlists uh, that uh, that I do get from some of my swimmers that will get them pumped up sometimes. You know, it's, it's crazy. You know, I get tired of uh, you know Taylor Swift and all these other. You know, <laughs> I, I do need to I do need to put on some ACDC, which which is good uh, majority of the time. But uh, no, uh, we warm up quite a bit in order to, uh, to get to the test set, and we usually just do a general warm down afterwards. There's not much more you can get out of them after they've done uh, a max effort. 
Absolutely. This might be a programmatic wide question. That's kind of an attache to the original question, but at what age group are the athletes beginning their test sets inside the DART program at Davis and Sacramento? So, Billy, why don't we start with you on this one? I think they start young. I mean, we I know our 9 and 10-year-olds do different, different sets um, and, and do test sets. I, I think for them, I think they our 9 10 coach calls them challenge sets um, versus test sets. And uh, for her, I think she sees the fun, and especially in younger boys, of that ability of challenging yourself, seeing where you're at before, um, and, and just racing and, and, and putting it out there. So uh, they start all the way from our competitive 910s all the way through, and they just get more advanced and, and a little more uh, focused on, on technical details as they develop into, into senior level swimmers. Sure. How about you, Bri? I think uh, most of our 10 and unders, they work on uh, kicking. The, the better kickers they are, you know, charting out how fast they can kick at that young age, I think uh, will allow their body position to stay higher on the water and most of their strokes. Um, I think at uh, sixth to eighth grade, uh, my assistant, uh, my head age group coach, Courtney, uh, she does a lot of uh, just kick main sets in order for, for us to get an idea, as well as uh, uh, test sets, hundreds, 200s in order for them to see what uh, she can give me as they go up within the program. So, you know, I, this, this next year, she was telling me that uh, one, uh, one or two of the kids in her group on two minutes, they're averaging under 120 for hundreds of kicking. And I think that's great. A little butterfly of hers can, can kick up a storm, which is great. Uh, I think it's important for that type of information to be passed on so that um, you know it's established at a younger age so that we can keep on progressing within their uh, their swimming career. That, that's a great point. And I love talking to other coaches about how important it is to incorporate some kick challenge sets at those younger ages. Uh, one time I heard Jason Turcott talking about if he could have one piece of information on all of his age group swimmers, it would be how fast is their 100 yard kick. So I, I think that that's something that's so critically important as as they get older and as they progress, not just in terms of the way that they think about competing in short course. But as the three of us know very well, you better have a heck of a good kick long course. Uh, in every single event. The game has changed, especially in distance swimming with the way that these, especially the ladies, are taking out the mile now. You better have that kick going if you're going to be anywhere near that top five. So, you know, that that's something that I've kind of taken to heart that, that Jason talked about a lot. Um, I am going to now open it up so that our coaches can see some of the nuts and bolts of what you guys are doing or listen to some of the nuts and bolts of what you guys are doing in terms of your test sets. Um, and I, I want to tell all the coaches who are on this webinar right now to grab that pad and paper so that you can follow along some of this. And I know, Billy, you have uh, something ready to share on the screen. So if you want to jump into that, I'm just going to have you go ahead and pull that up. And we'll see if we can get it on here. We we practiced this beforehand, guys, but we're not experts with technology yet. <laughs> so, works. Billy, I am going to uh, have you run through what happens with the Davis test sets. All right. You're seeing that okay? Seeing it perfect. Okay. So, um, like I said earlier, Mike, we, we're a little different in the fact that we're not at really a – a T30 and a big tracking test set team. So when you when we kind of talked about this being the subject matter to talk about, I, I kind of came up with the three things that we do um, in regards to testing in the senior group. It's sort of a little different outside the box. Um, we start off with training time ranges. And basically, we're trying to find um, ranges and track those ranges of certain um, – things for practice. And so an example of that would be, we'll do some repeats of 150s, um, say like eight 150s on 135 for kind of the top guys, where they'll descend by twos until um, their best effort on the last two. And we'll log the last two times 
uh, they get out of those 8150s. And I, and I feel like that puts them in a pretty uh, aggressive threshold range to uh, to give us sort of a baseline of, of what we want to train off of. I've never really found too many kids that, that, that did a T30 and were very, very good at holding a certain pace or, or could make it through and, and be solid throughout. So for us, we've used this to kind of create sets within the season. And what I kind of mean by that is, is that we go, uh, say, one one day a week, we'll go a threshold set. We'll go 12 150s on 140. Um, and we'll ask the athletes to hold within three seconds of their test result test set result. And what I feel like on this is it gives them the opportunity to one, take really good ownership of, of where they are within a swim versus saying, you know, Hey, I want you to be fast on these, or I want you to be threshold. Um, we'll have them check their heart rates pretty regularly and make sure that those times from the beginning of the season are, are kind of in the right range for them. And we'll adjust them if they aren't. Um, and then we'll even do sets with like a VO2 max set where they'll go say the same 12 150s, but add a little bit more rest time. So 150, maybe even two minutes. Um, and then they'll just descend one to three, four to six, uh, and so on and so on. Um, by number three, I want them within one second of their 150s. Um, at six, I want them at that time. By nine, I want them one second below that and 12, at least two seconds below that. So we use these testing mechanisms to make sure that when we're training, we're really getting the max out of what we're getting. And, and just so they have kind of a daily accountability. Sure. And you're getting really specific with the actual speed that they're traveling with in the pool. How, how do they handle that feedback when maybe they miss one or two repeats? What kind of feedback are you giving them to kind of get them back on track? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what kind of tar part of the season. I mean, it could be as as easy as, hey, I understand we're, you know, in a, in a heavier lifting phase right now, and this might be the cause of that. Um, and if they've done it in the past and been successful with it in the past, then then that might be the case. Um, and if it's, uh, you know, and we also, again, some of them do a great job, an amazing job maybe on the testing part. And then they, they've set maybe their threshold a little bit below where it actually is. And so we might have to take a step back, uh, but we learn that throughout the season. And then and the next season, we can kind of carry that over a little bit more to exactly know with a little bit more finite detail exactly where those paces kind of hit. Sure. So this first part of your training time range is you're really working on capacity, so to speak. Correct. Correct. That's, and and we do this with different strokes, too. Um, and, and so it just for us, again, it's just daily accountability that we're testing. So, uh, you know, we're just trying to create that uh, that feel for each day. Why each set, each set matters and each set has a purpose. Absolutely. So as we look at these, the repeats of the 150s, for example, that could be adapted, so to speak, as far as time goes, if you were to change to best stroke or stroke crawl. A stroke free or IM crawl, however you do it. Correct. You can do it. I mean, we can do, we'll do different repeats of, uh, you know, maybe another primary stroke and set kind of a training paces off of those. Um, we'll also do it um, with, if, yeah, if you're going to mix in different strokes, you can kind of use the freestyle as the base and then add in where you feel like the threshold uh, for other primary stroke would fit. Right on. And then this, the second part that we see here on your sheet is your race pace testing. So this would be, if I can use this phrase in terms of what we would use it at Victor, this is your lactate testing. Yes. Um, so what we do is we, we spend a full day doing this. So kids sign up for um, an hour block. And so say four kids will sign up for an hour at a time and my assistant will be there to help. And we come in and we we'll do sets where we'll do like two or three 100s working down to threshold pace. And then we'll go into some 50s. And, and what I'm going to show real quick, I'm going to stop sharing uh, this one real quick. Come back with you and show you a different document real quick. So it kind of goes into exactly how that would work. Um, and basically what we're looking for on this is very, very specific details within that set. So let me work through. 
So you actually have a spe a really special practice when you're talking about working with four athletes at a time. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. So four will come in from nine to ten. Four will come in from ten to eleven, and usually it takes almost an entire Saturday. Wow. So, and we'll do this about basically at the end of September. Um, and is this testing showing up okay? You got it. You're right on. Okay. So I took some examples. Like here was one of our better female athletes. Here's one of our better male athletes. You can probably figure out who that was. Um, <laughs> but basically, they kind of set out what their goal paces are. Um, and we come in and test them. And, and again, like I said, they'll do like three 100s to hit threshold. And then they'll go into two or three fifties of say uh, the young lady here testing for freestyle. She'll go into two or three fifties and we'll get very specific. We'll get her stroke rates. We'll get her kick counts off the wall. Uh, we'll get her stroke counts and then we'll get her overall time. And so, and really what we're doing for this is we're kind of trying to teach them what these specific categories mean to them and then allow them to train those specialized components throughout the season so that they understand the difference that all of a sudden if you're in a two or fly and you go from a six kick count off the wall and you're adding two or three strokes and your stroke rate drops your time's going to change so it's really uh specific and I'm, I'm happy to continue to share that but i'll probably go back to the other page real quick billy Sorry when we start. see your kick count there um, yep. are we saying that's going to be six kicks off every wall in this race? Correct. And, and we are holding you to that. Correct. Absolutely. Okay. And so they are, um, they have to be committed to that part. So that's the, the part where it's a communication. Even that day is to say, Hey, here's, uh, what your patterns are. Is that something that you feel that you could buy into and, and be accountable to? And, and they have to agree to that. So, and if they don't, we'll retest it again with a lower amount um, so that they feel like they 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 can actually do it within a race. Gotcha. Um, so we create those testing charts for them. And then that way they have, when, when, the, when we go to a meet, they're able to know their kick counts. They're able to know their stroke counts. They're able to know their stroke rates. Um, we can even do turn speed and, and breathing patterns and all that kind of stuff. But we're trying to get as specific as we can within that testing so that when we do sets and practice, there are those lactate sets, like you said, they have this that testable data and they know kind of where they need to be. So for me, it's easy if they're broken down to say, hey, your stroke rate was off. You were one three. What's your what's your race pace stroke rate supposed to be? Well, it's supposed to be one one. Well, that's why we know we weren't hitting pace. So you're um, able from that chart, you're able to look at ideal numbers and then say, there are some reasons why you might not have been so fast today. Here's what I'm seeing based on our ideal data. I think that's really important. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it's important for them to understand that part and then, then to, for them to actually be able to buy in within a training set. So say we're doing you know some 50s at pace uh, if you are doing those 50s at pace and your and your rate is faster than you're going to be able to hold within a race and your stroke count is super high you you know that's not going you're not going to be able to maintain that within a 200 back a 50 that works but a 200 doesn't work so we're really able to kind of we're trying to track that every day so that those kids are held a little bit more accountable with their stroke counts their specific kick numbers and really making sure what they can maintain within a within a practice, and they're training within those systems each each workout. Gotcha. Um, yeah, like I said, like here, so really trying to make sure that we're trying to build the energy system to support that. So if they're, you know, if they're going to try to go with a one one rate the entire time, they they need to be training at that position. So. Um, and that's sort of why that's built in. And the last part was really what Brian kind of talked about is, is we test our kicking. Um, that's our priority. Number one, um, you know, that you, like you talked about with having Jason Turcott actually interviewed Greg Meehan for our team, uh, this week, one of our zoom meetings for the kids. 
uh, to watch. And then, and I asked him that specific question of what his priority was of seeing out of an age group swimmer. And that was his exact answer too, was, was kicking. How good of kickers are they? Um, so I think for us, that's a really important part. One of our primary pools we train at is exactly 15 meters wide. Um, and so we can actually do widths and timed widths and things like that. So that we're really working on exactly your 15 meter speed to a wall. We don't even have to break out. And right. so that's another right. part that we test pretty regularly of um, kick speed and even even explosive kick speed. That's fantastic. And <clears throat> are you uh, are are you recording those timed kicks? Yeah, especially early in the season. Um, and then the kids are pretty. You know, we we want them to be accountable too. So whether you're 15 meter kick speed and things like that, there. I most of the times I'm not recording that stuff. I kind of have them. They know kind of their world record uh 15 meter speed and what we kind of want to be at for a race right uh, but for like hundreds and progression for kicks overall like what's your fastest possible interval you know what's your fastest possible 100 kick things like that we are recording so when we're talking about somebody uh like luca what are we looking at for 15 meters kick so for him across the pool, you're probably looking at anywhere in the four two, um, you know, to four eight range, just depending on what he's focusing on. But yeah, he's explosive at that 15 meter mark. We were in Colorado Springs, I think two two years ago. Um, he was there. We were doing a uh, we were doing a 50 long core stroke count. And I watched him, and it was the easiest butterfly I think I ever watched in my life. I mean, and and a lot of it was just just so much power from his hips through his toes. Yeah, he can kick. I mean, he can do repeats. Like, we'll do, um, you know, 50s, a repeat kick, where it'll just be underwater to 15 meters and then dolphin kick. And, uh, I mean, he can repeat those at 24, 25s, um, 50 meter, 50 yards. Um, repeat so he, he can he can kick smooth and and brian when we look at the sacramento program and the breakdown of how you're putting together your testing and your test sets what does that look like well, i'm not as definitely not as uh educational as billy is when it comes to putting it onto the shared screen so i apologize for not having that uh, <laughs> that's uh, totally fine man right yeah. um like i said my um uh, more of traditionalist with uh, with the threshold uh, test set of a uh, you know different different years with different swimmers uh, could be a three thousand for time could be a twenty minute swim for time. Um, this past year, I had uh, mainly uh, a lot of middle distance swimmers uh, that uh, working with working with someone like uh, my assistant coach, Coach Courtney, who um, got her master's degree in exercise physiology. I, I turned to her to, to kind of look at where the time domain that we can work with, with the athletes that we have in the pool. So sometimes it's uh, eight, eight 300s uh, instead of 10 300s and, and get the best out of that. And then I go to, um, the, uh, to get their threshold, uh, to get their last take, uh, still going like you, like you say you do with the six 200s. Um, I share with the kids, um it, it's old school share it with the kids the old john or band check um if you hold this and this is your average on your six six two hundreds this and and john had a, a line across that had this formula that here's the estimated end of the season time that you'll get um would it would it be exact maybe would it would it give them uh hope each time we do the test set that they make improvements that they're getting closer and closer to that projected goal time that they have. Um, I have a set that um, came from a uh, former Cal Bear uh, dad, uh, one of the kids, um, uh, dad's Larry Groover, who was uh, up at Penguin swim team. Um, I, uh, many of my kids, if, if some of the coaches on here that have coached with me, uh, we do a, a set that is all based on a hundred uh, minute 30 we do and i chart it out i have a chart right here kind of you can't see it it has a starting got it. 
and and uh, starting first 50, and then it gives 200 goal pace for the 50s, 75 goal pace for at the 75 mark from a push. We go 10 50s on 130 at the 200 pace. Um, I've incorporated in from that. I've incorporated in what I've learned from Billy. I've incorporated in that the kids need to know what their stroke count is as well as as their turnover rate in order to get to their 200 goal pace. So if their goal pace uh, uh, goal time is 139, they're out in 23-2, they're holding 25 twos. How easy can they swim 25-2 with a moderate stroke count so they're not you know, burning, burning the, at the lactic acid level at, at the 75 yard mark. And then we go 10 75s on the 130. And those that want a goal time of 139 have to be about 37.8. You know, that's ideal, of course. And then at the end, we test their, uh, test their heart. We have 10 100s best average. And the best swimmer that I've ever had held 52s. For the 10, what was the what was the rest on that, Brian? What was the rest on that best average set? It's on one thirty. Let's so go. Every interval is one thirty. Let's go. So they they have ten fifties on one thirty, ten seventy fives on one thirty, ten one hundreds on one thirty. Um, uh, Billy knows the the swimmer that I have. I mean, he's an old guy. I call him my uh, my <laughs> grandfather of the group. He's I think he, I think Billy. I think Sonny turned twenty six. He might have yeah. turned 26 already. Um, he uh, he was an NCAA qualifier. He was a uh, uh, out of Cal Poly. Went like 14, 50 low. I think he was like 15th or 16th at NCAA's when he was there. Um, when he swam for me, he uh, those last 10 100s, he averaged like 52 lows. So yeah, he, he was a machine. I do have to say that if he was swimming for me when Billy was, uh, well, Billy, he was there for a little bit, but if I had Billy a little bit earlier, I would have taught Sonny how to kick a little bit more. And I think he would have been even faster. Sure. He's not one that he's not one to have kicked a lot at, at, uh, at practice or in a meet. He's kind of a, a grind out type of swimmer. So, you know, I, uh, that's a set that I, that I go to the swimmers know, um, I have honed in on that set. So, uh, going into about four weeks out from a taper meet, I um, I will end that set at four four rounds. So it'll be four fifties, four seventy fives, and four one hundreds. So from there, from four weeks out, five weeks out will be five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'll start it at that that tenth, you know, six six weeks out, eight weeks out from there. I love that, Brian. And two things that I caught there that I want to talk to you about. The first one is you didn't say this verbatim, but the idea is we need to teach these athletes how to swim fast easier. So you talked about stroke counts. What are some of the Billy's got his chart? What are some of the things that you do to remind these athletes of, of their stroke tempo, stroke rate and and their stroke count throughout those pace sets? What I what I do is I have uh, another assistant coach with me, which is great, and we'll we'll go through. We we obviously everybody every team has certain athletes that do need reminding, uh, and that's okay, and that's our job. We're supposed to be reminding and and honing in on uh, our athletes and trying to touch them in a way to let them know, hey, you know, you were you were. 17 strokes a lap. You're, you're actually supposed to be 14. Let, let's concentrate on that a little bit more. What make them think a little bit more. Are you getting out? Like Billy said, um, hit what I've learned from Billy is may have the kids commit to the kick out, you know, just because you're tired doesn't mean that you cannot get those six kicks that, uh, that maybe one of his kids are saying, or maybe one of my kids is saying I'm committing to four. Well, go four on those sets. If you're taking three and all of a sudden you're taking two extra strokes, there's your extra strokes. Right. And, and I go around, uh, we'll, we'll start counting kids strokes and then we'll start reminding them and working on different details. And what we see is their commitment to uh, kicking out, commitment to length of stroke and commitment to tempo. 
Definitely. The other thing that you mentioned with those test sets is how as you get closer to that season culminating meet or as you're tapering, the number of repeats comes down. I think the art of coaching is handling that scenario where as they come down and as you're doing less, we feel like we should be faster. What do you do on that off day when that athlete's not hitting faster times or even going the same time that they're capable of going on a set where they're doing even more repeats? How do we engage the swimmer during a scenario like that? I've talked to my swimmers about technique mainly. Um, everybody's going to have an off day. Uh, we don't know what type of baggage that they've had at school or what, what's been going on with a job. And, you know, uh, like, like my older swimmer, uh, Sonny Fierro, I mean, he's a soil tester. He's lifting boulders at work basically eight hours a day and doing testing on soil. Um, there were days when he came in nice and fresh and there were days that he came in and he could barely lift his arms let alone a, a teenager that comes in. Um, uh, you know, we hopefully don't have, have some of those that, you know, they, they might have failed the test at school. They're coming in and, you know, their head's not in the game. And I'm, you know, we're going to have to uh, let them know, hey, you know, it's all right. You know, use this as an outlet. Um, do the best job you can. But here's something to think about. Work on that technique. Work on that stroke count. A uh, little thing, work on a tighter streamline and uh, work on your kickout number. The times may not be there at practice today, but the technique of what you're trying to accomplish at the end of the season, you're, you're going to accomplish during a practice like that. So there is success uh, at every practice. You may not be winning the practice, but you'll be successful at the practice. Absolutely. And I, I think it's so important, right, for us to think about, and be aware of everything that happens outside of the pool that they might be bringing in. A lot of times as we get closer to a taper meet and we're doing a set, Brian, almost the exact set that you laid out, we do that. And when they don't hit the times that they think they should be, we have to have those conversations. So I think that's really important. And I'm, I'm glad that, that you guys uh, both addressed that a little bit. How much time, would you guys say passes from the beginning of the season to when you start your testing? So you both have some regimented test sets that you put to work, but at what point of the season do you start? So at Victor, our coaching staff, we, we typically wait until about the first week of October. We've been in for about 30 days uh, and we're ready to race and the kids know it's coming. And then sometimes that first Monday, we don't even let them know at the end of warm up, ACDC comes on and they go crazy every year. That first test set is that they get so thrilled about it. Number one, they, they know because it takes a lot of time that it's going to be a relatively lower volume practice. And number two, they're going to get to race. Um, so when do you guys start? And I'll start with you, Billy. We're the same. I mean, we're, 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 we're you know, we're creating that the baseline of, of where we want for overall <laughs> fitness level. Uh, we do a lot of technical um, tweaking early in the season. And, and really we start the concept we always start with is the first three to four weeks, the base is built off the legs. Um, so we're doing a ton of early season kicking. And so, yeah, we're probably very similar in the fact that it's late September to early October before we feel like we're, we're able to kind of like hit the paces and find the, uh, the areas that we want to be in for the testing part of, of how we run our testing program. I'm glad you said that. And the, the three of us talked about uh, some experiences at Stanford. Uh, when I wasn't getting yelled at, uh, I, uh, I used to hear Skip say all the time, you're not in shape until your legs are in shape. And, right. and, I, and I, I really love that mentality. So, Brian, over at Sacramento, are, are you guys kind of doing the same thing? You're starting after you get some good work in? Yeah, probably more so the end of September, similar to you guys. I think uh, – good four weeks in, um, establish, establish stroke technique, establish a good level of endurance with the legs. And then once, once, uh, I think the kids know, I think, uh, uh, when you've created a culture like Billy and yourself, uh, the kids know about when it's going to come. I mean, two or three, three weeks have gone by. They're like, uh, something's about to, you know, we're about, 
getting going. We're about to start racing and, and, and getting a little faster and the coaches are going to want to start seeing some, some stuff. So I think uh, anywhere between end of September, early October. Awesome. Yeah. I think, I think that's probably true, right? If we look across the board uh, in the U S um, we talked a little bit about this um, with Billy, um, but we, we didn't talk about this yet with you, Brian. Are, do your test sets address all four strokes? Are they, are they best prime stroke? Do you rotate IM freestyle? At Victor, our lactate sets, we, we typically get through a full cycle every year, one set IM, one set free, one set best stroke, and then one set second stroke. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about how you might work different strokes inside of your test sets and Brian we'll start with you I'm I mainly freestyle on my test sets um, I do on on the on the vo2 sets I will allow the uh, on the six twos we may go free free I am free stroke um, on the hundreds we'll do uh, free and stroke but mainly in the past couple of years I've uh, I've actually, it came out of a Swimming World magazine. I, I'm going to admit, I, I stole it from uh, Swimming World and I kind of stole it from Missouri. Uh, I, I actually roomed with uh, Mark Gangloff at the National Coaches Clinic. I was there with Billy a couple of years back and I talked to Mark about this. Uh, so Missouri had those two breaststrokers that were really fast, but yes. I, talked to Mark, I talked to Mark and he uh, told me that, um, all the stroke people did similar sets and there were three sets. And then I started cycling through to get faster results out of my kids. And um, then it came down to what I learned from Billy is swimming faster at, at practice and getting race pace. So the three sets that I, I cycle through once, once we get through the freestyle threshold, um, I think uh, uh, a couple of years back, it was uh, Tuesdays. We went, uh, three rounds of 1050s at 200 pace with uh, a minute rest in between. So different strokes at the different intervals, like 50 seconds for fly as yards, 50 seconds for fly, 55 for breast. And then Thursday or the following week would be three rounds. Odds easy, even fast, 825, 650s and four 100s. Um, and I, I would pick Mark's brain on that and find out how fast those guys were going. They were wicked fast those two, uh, those two breaststrokers and then on saturday uh we did a two minute set where uh i i sampled with the kids from that swimming world magazine 150 freestyle it was build 100 stroke build 50 fast from a push uh, 100 dive and 100 easy all on two minutes five rounds and started cycling through and i actually started that when I had a good group of, uh, Billy and I, uh, we cycled through kids, right? I had a good group of, of kids three years ago that graduated. I have a girl, Amelie Falkenthal at Stanford, uh, all American there. Uh, I think she, uh, she still holds the California high school state record of 48, three and 22, two in the 50. But, um, she actually, Billy, Billy can tell you, she's probably, she's a good 50 swimmer. I get it. But, if she were to have swum a fully rested 200 freestyle, I think she could have been real. I mean, she could still be really good at it. And uh, I have a, my daughter uh, was in that <laughs> class, uh, as well as a couple other swimmers that have moved on at, at UC San Diego and at uh, uh, San Diego State. But I think I started implementing those sets in the practice. And they started going faster without me having to track their stroke test results from a, uh, a max VO2 test set. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Billy, how about you? When, when you're, we talked a little bit about how you cycle some of that through. Um, are you doing that same blueprint that we saw with the 150s? Are you doing that uh, threshold with, with different strokes? And then when you get to your race pace training, are you, are you mixing in different strokes? Yeah, it's a lot of different strokes. So they have a chance of, uh, I mean, we'll do days where they'll be, you know, like Brian does freestyle primary, especially more the the 150s. And when you're just trying to get more energy system in, work in versus specifics, um, you know, when I'm trying to train your engine, 
Um, a lot of times those cut that kind of work for us falls in a little bit more freestyle or kick based. And then when you're trying to, well, the, when you get more specifics on the details and the, and the race pace and, and those kind of things, like we do a set where, uh, where we really try to, I feel like we, this last year or so, we were not getting out and being very aggressive into what we were doing. And, and we did a set where we were, we were testing within practice, a, we would do something like a dive 50 and then they'd have like a 300 easy between. And then they would do a dive 100 where their feet had to be within three tenths of where they were for their dive 50. And the idea was, again, just kind of progressing this way through. Of a, Then they would do a dive 150 and their 100 mark had to be within a second of where they were for their all out 100. And the idea was just this idea of progressing where you need to be and the speed that you need to get out with. Um, and a lot of that's done with stroke. Um, and how do we how do we find that? And, and for me, I, I feel like we started once we start to break down to we're, we're seeing the weaknesses that we want to work on from, you know, hey, where did your kick count go the last 50? <clears throat> hey, where did your stroke rate go the last 50? And, and, and we're kind of starting to figure that out through the season and, and hopefully get better at it as we go through the season. Sure. sure. And and I think that's really important to, to understand when you're mixing in what stroke and when and who needs that specific extra stroke work maybe within the group. And Brian, you mentioned that Swimming World set. When you get a second here in the next couple minutes, uh, we're going to be able to download Billy's PowerPoint, I, I would imagine, because he'll send me the link because that's what great coaches do. They share all of their secret info. Yeah. Uh, Brian, if you could type it into the comments, just a, a, that that Swimming World set that you got, that would be awesome. A lot of people are asking me for it. And yep. then, guys, we have a great coach uh, on our, our webinar right now. He's probably enjoying the weather down there in Florida. Coach Dave Gibson is asking us about uh, the test sets. Are they on a cycled schedule a certain day of the week? And have you ever run them in the morning to kind of simulate a prelim session? I think those are great questions. So, uh, Brian, I'll have you start with that. I I cycle my uh, test sets once every uh, four weeks. Uh, like for the 200s, it, like I, if I started the test set at the end of September, I'll have the six twos on a Saturday. Uh, my Friday night will actually – I. I've made too many mistakes where I hammered some kids on a Friday night and Saturday morning. The test sets were just uh, just awful. So I've learned to uh, each time I know that a test set I will be cycling around and coming through, it will be very similar on a Friday night and the Saturday will be set up the same way because the only way that I'm going to get um, somewhat similar uh, recovery as well as preparation will be on basically anywhere between 24 hours before that test set and what you do warming up for that test set, uh, having a controlled environment. The only thing, like Billy says, in our area, Saturday morning could be 27 degrees out. You have icicles coming down from your starting blocks and the water is uh, cold and, and the wind could be like 40 miles an hour. Um, but I think uh, most of uh, my cycles happen at the same time. Uh, every two weeks, uh, once we get into the season, uh, the, the threshold test set probably uh, once every four weeks. Awesome. How about you, Billy? Mine are probably a little, my, again, my, my system's a little different in the fact that we're testing in the, in the early season and then we're kind of making that work through sets throughout the year. Uh, but the, the part that I kind of, uh, looked at with uh, Dave's question was uh, that we do some in the morning for prelims and things like that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, we have, have implemented that a couple of times, especially this last year, we were being very specific about with, uh, with, with Luca, with trying to work towards training towards a, a finals at the Olympics that were going to be done in the morning. Um, and so some of our training kind of switched that up a little bit to create opportunities for him to race in the mornings. Um, and understand how to be fast in the mornings. Uh, the other opportunity for us is we actually train seven days a week. Uh, we do a little less mornings than the average club, I think, but we uh, we train on a seven-day cycle. So we have mornings on Saturday and Sunday. Um, and some of those times we'll 
provide opportunities for them even to suit up on the weekends to come in and do some some testing to where um, broken swims to um, specific race strategies. We worked a lot on where do you want to be at the 150 for your goal 200 this last year. Um, you know, a year ago we worked on that with Luca and he wanted to be at 140 in the tuner fly. And so we, we knew we had to be at a certain point. Um, and he started off going 150s from a dive and he would go 118s. Um, and throughout the season, he worked his way down and, and, and probably a month before he went, his, went 140, he went uh, 115.8 in practice um, from a dive. And so it's testing that mechanism of where you want to be at a certain point in that race and, and how long can we hold it? We feel like with the rest, he would have that last 50. He'd maybe have a little bit more out speed than what we had with him practice. And so we kind of followed that through, but we definitely uh, kind of kept it on a routine. It just wasn't necessarily the same set or the same progression each time. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that, Billy, because there have been times with some of the athletes that, that we have had who have been in that that special category. Um, and one of our most recent who had a lot of great races with Emma Barksdale over the course of her development and career. Um, it was about thinking about how fast we needed to be in the morning at summer juniors. At summer juniors, if you're not fast in the morning or on your seat time, forget it. There's no second swims happening. So we started this thing that I called the ABAT test set, which was an aerobic best average test. And this athlete's a distant swimmer and an IMer. So we would go 10 100s on 10 seconds rest. Hold your best average. We go two minutes rest, and then we go eight 100 IMs on 30 seconds rest, hold your best average. And I did that every Thursday morning. And then as Brian mentioned earlier, as we got closer to the meet, it came down to eight and six, and then six and four, and then four and two. And on that four and two set, boy, we were really, really fast. And that was a really good way to get ordinarily a swimmer who struggled to get up for prelims, who would soar in every finals. But now we're talking about bigger meets. And uh, it, it has really helped her at the NCAA level to understand that, listen, when you get to NCAAs, if, if you're not there in prelims, it's game over, guys. You know, so right. that that was a set that I think was a, a game changer. And, and I'm glad that Coach Gibson asked that. And Brian, thank you. You've got that set up there now. Um, and, and people can take a look at that. That That's going to be one that the, the athletes at Victor Swim Club will see very soon. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, thank you very much. The next thing that we're moving on to, guys, is after you conduct your test sets and you collect all the data from those performances, um, do you look back, and, and I think we all do this as coaches, right? Do you look back and, and kind of see where certain athletes perform very well during the season, what time of the year that they're performing well, or when they swim really poorly? Uh, and does that information – help you tailor specific taper details to individuals? I mean, I think our society as a whole, as coaches, we're starting to understand that we have to be a little bit more specific for each swimmer in our program. Not everybody's going to rest the same. There's a lot of different physiological factors. There's a lot of different mental, emotional factors. Does that information from your test sets, does that help you in creating your taper plans? And I'll start with you, Billy. Oh, that's a hell of a question. I wish I had this the greatest answer in the world for, but I, I think the the idea of coaching is, you know, when we were young, I think we all thought we knew what we were doing. And and I think the more I learn, the the less I think I actually know. Um and 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 especially in regards to taper and especially in regards to specific training for specific athletes. I, I feel like it's, you know, a, a great coaching job is 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 when you mix in the training part and a little bit of the art. Um, I like the word you used art earlier, art. I think there's an art to what we do um, and, and seeing where the kids are in each week and seeing, you know, what phase they're in, um, seeing how broken down they are as, as you head into taper. I mean, you're going to get some kids that two week, a uh, week and a half out look buried and some kids that look way too darn fast and way too darn good a week and a half out. Um, and so, 
Yeah, I mean, I think every season you're coming back and saying what worked, what didn't work, and uh, and where we felt like we need to make adjustments. Um, I mean, we have kind of like end of the season meetings with the athletes that kind of say, what do you think worked? What do you think didn't work? Um, you know, and, and some of that you take with a grain of salt and some of that you, uh, you are is helpful. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I adjust every season a little bit and tweak a little bit every season. And, and like Brian says, he, he's, he's learned some things from me, but I've learned a lot from him too. And the fact that, uh, you know, we, we discuss all these things of what, what did you do that you felt like worked well? What did I do that we think worked well? And, and, and this next season, how do we adjust and try to make this work out a little bit better? Sure. Brian, same thing over to you. What, what are you doing with some of this data and, and how's it helping you uh, progress the training in your program as you move towards those season culminating meets? Yeah, I think, you know, definitely the going into taper it, it definitely is not an exact science. It, you know, you have, uh, we brought 40 some odd kids to the sectional meet uh, in Texas this last spring and have, uh, you know, many of them, uh, a third of them were mine. And you look at all the different events that they swim uh, from a distance swimmer down to down to a sprinter. And, you know, it was just like Billy said, it, it's figuring out what they've done uh, prior prior to on the test set seeing how much uh, the athlete do, does, does my distance swimmer need a little bit more rest? Are they a little bit more on the muscular side? Um, does my swimmer, my sprinter, you know, uh, she may be a little lankier with not, not as much muscle. She may not, my sprinter may not need as much rest as someone that's more muscular. Um, and so just working with that athlete and working with um, the events that they swim are important for the data that comes from, the test test sets are important, but also the the body types and the individ and talking with the individual swimmer and getting their honest opinion. I don't think um, many of our swimmers are going to uh, BS their way out of a practice just because you know, hey coach, I I I think I need a sprinter. Uh, may say, I need to just do a little bit more. I, I need to warm up another a little bit more to just get ready or a distance swimmer comes in and they just feel like they're blown out and they need to do a little bit less. You know, um, they're listening to their bodies as much as we're telling them to listen to their bodies. If they don't feel well, uh, make an adjustment. And sometimes just because you have the data from test sets doesn't mean that uh, that's specific to how well they're going to do uh, at the end of taper. I'm, I'm really glad that you, you touched on that, Brian, because you know, as a young coach, when I was first coming up, the last thing that I wanted to do is have that conversation with Natalie. Just trust the program and you're going to go fast, right? That's how we think when we're young. And I think if, if you really want to get your athletes to that elite level, if that's their goal, it has to be your goal. And the only way to get there is to do it collaboratively. And I think a lot of young coaches want to say, trust the process, trust the process, trust the process. But it's a working relationship and they know a lot more about themselves than we do. No matter how much we think we know about swimming, they know a lot more about themselves than we do. And for me, that's been one of the biggest challenges of progressing as, as a coach in, in the sport of swimming. We, we have to know when we can trust their feedback, which probably 90% of the time is 100% right on. And, and I'm glad you touched on that. The other thing you mentioned was body morphology, right? So there are three types of body morphology. We have endomorphs, ectomorphs, and mesomorphs. Your mesomorphs are your muscular athletes. You know, those kids might need some more rest. And, and you have to be willing to take that risk and say, you're right. You you, you need to back off. So that, that that's something that I think a lot of coaches and, and young coaches need to be aware of study those things, understand what body morphology is and, and physiology and apply it to your coaching. Uh, well, I we, think, oh, go uh, ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Mike. I think what comes of it now, I'll, I'll admit I was, I, I got brought up into, you know, the, my way or the highway type of deal. And I think um, definitely uh, as, as a young coach, you, 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 you grow from there and then, you never stop learning. I mean, similar to, to Mike, I know you reach out to a lot of other coaches. I know Billy does. I mean, we're all, all on 
right now all on Zoom calls, learning about more of what other programs are doing. And, you know, not, you know, a kid comes in and it's not always my way or the highway. And I think, you know, we, we all have evolved from there. And definitely if any of my uh, coaches that have uh, swam with me are now coaches, understand that uh the changes that billy is probably you know we're we're a little older now so the way we were back 15 years ago are definitely not the way we are right now so we have definitely keep on learning as coaches and uh, i appreciate you putting this together oh yeah thank you this, this has been such a great way for us to learn and share ideas we got a great question over in the chat from josh delecki do you guys run different test sets for different event groups, sprint, distance, middle distance, I am? I'll start, Josh, by saying that uh, every week throughout the season, we do uh, something that the kids refer to as a distance set test set. I call it an aerobic test set. And we also do a lactate set. So my opinion is that nobody is anything until they've proven that they are that thing. And usually when they prove that they are that thing, it's in the college realm. So our athletes are swimming every event from the 50 to the mile, every stroke, every distance, every I am. So I feel like if I'm taking care of that spectrum, we're, we're doing the athlete a favor by promoting versatility in their training. And I think it also leads to injury prevention. So aerobic test set, the kids call it a distance test set. And a lactate set, the kids call it a sprint test set. We do that. Uh, Billy, would you agree with that? You're, you're kind of more macro than trying to focus in on specific sprint test sets. Yeah. I mean, I think later in the season, we might get into something a little more specific, but, but really early in the season, you're exactly right. I think we are, uh, we're trying to design athletes that uh, can be hundred to 500 range um, and through our program. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of success with 400 IMers with 200 to stroke athletes. And I, and I think to do that, you've got to create um, that mix of, you know, your your lactate levels all the way to your aerobic capacity generation set. So um, it definitely uh, varies. It's very similar throughout the, the prime part of the season with the idea that we might, as we test specific mechanisms later in the season, it might be more specific where the sprint girls will go 25 to foot touch and the 200 kids will go 125 to a foot touch and just kind of uh, mixing it up. But that's that's usually your, your last six weeks um, leading into a taper. I love those odd distances, brother. Odd distances, <laughs> man. Got to go just a little bit further than you want to. How about you, Brian? Uh, I not Not the odd distances. I, I started doing that a little bit more. Um, once I once I started picking Billy's brain, um, doing the the thirty seven fifties, you know, the lap and a half, I think is important to um, to hit. Um, we started doing that a little bit more from a dive. Um, Can you talk about the specifics of that, Brian? Because that idea, and I know that you guys have done that just based on me having spies everywhere. Um, but but can you talk a little bit about what it actually means, how it's actually performed? Because it's an outside the box thought and there's really specific intention behind it. So can you discuss that quickly? Well, with definitely with the intention of the 3750, I know uh, similar to what Billy was saying earlier about controlling that out speed, not blowing it out in the first 25 knowing what your stroke count is um that first lap when you're rested and tapered what does it feel like it feels like nothing but it has a result it may not feel like nothing but you've got to feel fast even though you're swimming nice and smooth and one of the things that that i've tried to build into the kids is that uh, not only going into the wall um, at practice if you're not going hard or fast into the wall at practice, then you're shortchanging yourself once you get to the swim meet because that wall is going to come up that much faster, maybe even a, a, as much as a second faster or more on that first lap. And to not hit that wall spot on is is going to be detrimental to the rest of your race. Um, 
as well as once you hit that turn, knowing knowing that energy system that you have to kick out and break out to that. You know, if you have a kid that's not a very good underwater kicker, like my son's not a very good underwater kicker, he is a streamlined kick, doesn't dolphin kick, a flutter kick and, and get one body length past the flags and get up and go. Um, where, you know, you watch you watch a Luca, you know, a 37, a 37 and a half, he's still underwater. And so you're you're taking the time from there. That, that That's exactly right. Yeah, I think I think that that's so important to understand the speed into and out of the wall. And I think Brian's probably got a refresh here, but I'm yeah. gonna uh, jump over to the next topic, Billy. And that's um, what what's the most impressive test set, you, Billy? You alluded to something that I think, um, or actually Brian alluded to something that Sonny did a, a couple, maybe a year or two ago on on his test sets, but. What's one of the most impressive test sets that you've witnessed this past year? And it doesn't even doesn't even necessarily have to be a test set. It could be a practice. But what's a set that sticks out in your mind and, and an athlete who put together an extraordinary effort? Um, as an overall group, we did some. Uh, I thought we have we've got a, we've got a young boy who's going to be a freshman at South Carolina who's you know been three fifty four four hundred meter free. Um, and then Luca, I think has been 351 ish. Um, so we've got a couple guys in that 400 range and then a couple young guys coming up that are, uh, sophomores that are, that are really solid. And, uh, those guys doing some repeat one fifties descend and watching four guys end up, uh, somewhere between one elevens and, and one fourteens, um, was pretty awesome in practice. Um, and I, and I will say that, uh, you know, Luca for all his talent and all the stuff that he does, he he's a hell of a worker in practice. Um, I mean, he can do stuff where he'll get up and uh, over Christmas training and, and pop off a 46, 800 fly from a dive at the end of practice. Um, and just watching some things like that is, is pretty, pretty fun. Um, so yeah, just a lot of the race pace stuff is, is a lot of fun to watch. Some of this, the, the grinding repeats. So when they're working their way down into, uh, into things that set them. Some of the girls who were trying to break a couple of girls trying to break five minutes this year, doing some 300 repeats and ending up down at three double O or lower. Uh, those are, you know, the exciting moments when you kind of see like, Hey, this is, this is starting to head down that direction. And we're starting to look at look good heading down this path. When you have an athlete put together a set like that, or they do something really special, are their teammates getting fired up too? Is it something that kind of inspires a whole group? Yeah, it's amazing how that becomes, you know, really a, a buzzworthy um, accomplishment within practice and how other kids see that, too, and and buy into it and, and accelerate, too. And when all of a sudden one of the kids, I mean, the great thing is we had we had a set one time where uh, it was a different design. And I can't remember exactly where it was, but it was this thing where they had to go. I think it was something like where they did 100 free on it for a time. And then they had a couple like hypoxic 25s and then they'd go 200 free at that 100 free pace. And then they had a couple hypoxic 25s and then a 300 free. And it just, it just progressed to get harder and harder and harder. And some of the boys, especially the young ones who haven't quite learned how to train um, and how to like manage within a set, you know, we're going out in 54 in the first hundred. And the older guys were just kind of <laughs> like, uh, this is going to be funny. This is going to be good. <laughs> And, uh, and watching those guys, but they actually set the tone for those older guys to have to go faster earlier than they may have wanted to go. Um, and seeing sets like that where, where your teammates kind of force you into something outside of your comfort zone and box. Um, and then the, the creation at the end where they, they laugh at it a little bit, but yet they got one great, amazing set out of it is, is really cool to see. Absolutely. We, we, um, we, we love when test sets – get competitive um our a, a couple of years ago we had a, a group of really good girls and um we would we do a test set where we go six five hundreds on eight minutes and i think on number five and six we we had a couple girls right at five minutes maybe one dipping under but you watch that and it's kind of fun and at the same time we had some boys who were you know going under 440 in practice off a push and and you start to see that and i remember there was 
there was a couple college coaches at the practice and they, they had said to me, is this what it's like every day here? <laughs> and I said, on the good days, you know, those, those yeah, are the days. Okay. <laughs> That's right. On the good days, you know, that you, you hope to see that. But, um, you know, it, it's it's something that I think coaches need to recognize with their athletes when you're having somebody do something pretty extraordinary. Uh, it, I think it's good to recognize that and it's good for the group to recognize that. And Brian, you're back. Uh, I just asked Billy and, and he had a great answer for it. Um, and I'm going to ask you now, what has been a test set this year or even a practice where you had an athlete do something pretty extraordinary? Uh, I think I shared this with, um, uh, coach Reed, one of Billy's assistant coaches. I have a, swimmer um uh breaststroker uh she's not very big her name's lucy she's kind of a workout grinder one of those workout uh, kids uh, that you hope that you know down the road that you know one of one of the, these tapers are just going to just light it up um we started out the season um going 250s on 40 and then 100 easy or a 50 easy on a minute and she got up to 1050s on 40, and this is breaststroke. And then she, uh, we started minusing a second off each week. So she got down to 36 on going, and I, was char I, I looked it up before, she did 750s on 36 seconds. And, you know, one of the things I'm trying to figure out with her, and it's, you know, particular athlete, is you know she she went 218 high and you know we're looking at you know she should be probably like you know probably 215 mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to a race because she can grind it out i mean some of those sets that uh, she was doing um definitely kind of add up to that so uh that was one of the test sets that stood out this year sure Sure. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, when, when we see an athlete do something extraordinary in practice in your mind, you say to yourself as a coach, boy, when we get to this meet, this person's going to light it up. And sometimes we're right on with that. And then other times we have to help them see what they're capable of. Right. So I try not to use the phrase, remember what you did in practice too often. Cause that only works every once in a while. Yeah, But what I try to get them to understand is we know collectively that, that you're capable of doing things that would allow you to do X, right? That's the X factor. What type of things do we have to change now to get you there? And, and I think the biggest part of that that comes into all of these conversations is, is mental training. And, and that's, that's the topic that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have building a bulletproof mindset. So that'll be something that's fun to talk about. Guys, this question has been uh, super fun the last couple of weeks. And, and I think you probably took a look at it uh, before we jumped on today. But you're stranded on a desert island with some of your best athletes. You, you can only do three main sets. Okay. What are they and why? So, Billy, why don't you get us started here? My um, team kind of hates this set because we do it pretty regularly. That's how you um, know it's good. Yeah, and so uh, – and I was laughing because I've got a post-grad that trained all the way through high school with me, but she's back training with me now. And uh, and so I was joking, she's probably done this set 100, 150 times by now. But I think it's just a really uh, – for them a lot, as a tool, um, they'll do a set where they'll go uh, – two 100s and then a 125 and they'll go through that four or five times and, and the idea behind the set is say you've got a girl that's sort of uh five double oh 500 freestyler they'll go 115 on everything so the two 100 frees are on 115 the 125 is on 115 and the idea and they and again they're repeating that with no rest between five times so they basically have to go the first two 100s aren't too bad then they've got to haul ass on the basically on the 125 to make it. Then they've got to fall back into that 100, one minute, 15 second interval again, and then go fast again and then fall back. So 
there really is no recovery. It's all active recovery work uh, between that set. And you can set that set up for uh, like a Luca and a Connor, and those guys can go 105. So, um, you know, go 100s on 105 and then 125s on 105. And, and you want them to have that two to three second touch the wall, see the clock drop and go. Um, we never tried the double O. It's probably, they, I don't think they can make five rounds of that, but it's, it's a pretty great set. And uh, I think they get a lot of work out of it. I think they learn a lot about themselves in it. Um, and then, you know, we do, like I said earlier, we do a lot of sets where we progress. So they'll go something like a dive. It could be dive 25. You can start with a 50 or whatever. Where we're really carrying speed all the way through and teaching them how to continue that speed throughout. So say it's a dive 50, some recovery time, dive 100, some recovery time, dive 150, uh, or even if it's push. Uh, but it's controlling that speed to make sure that you're able to carry it for a certain amount of time. And so that's, those are two sets we do pretty regularly throughout our program. It's awesome, man. That's awesome. I like, I like the short interval. Let's, hey, let's just make it and then let's go as fast as we can right after. It's awesome. How about you, Brian? You got three sets. You're on a desert island. They're the only three sets you can do, and you got to prepare for the Olympic Games. What are you doing? I think I'm. I, you know, one of the things that that I've learned over the past couple of years, and we did a couple of years ago, and I was texting back and forth with Billy prior to this going. I I, I really like our uh, set that we did. There's no amount of 150s. Uh, the interval's 201. Uh, Billy, it was with what Carmel and Nashville, what, or yeah. who else was it with? Yeah, um, I think maybe Dynamo two and a couple Dynamo of them. So you started on on the top. The intervals two hundred one. You make the one hundred and fifty before you, the the second hand gets back to the top. So you know, I forgot what's his name. The the, the Carmel kid at Texas now. Uh, I forgot Killer. Billy. Yeah, well, he told me he went. I mean, it was like within our uh, four four teams, and he was like, "What?" One, he got up to the. We left. He got up to the forty forty seven or something, and made uh, it. He made it one, like uh, one hundred and fifty on one twelve or something like that. Yeah, one twelve. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, I love that. Yeah. I love that set. That set. That set will definitely. Um, I think it is a good training set to, to establish. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I was telling, I had Chris and Ian on and I, and I remember I was standing, uh, on the deck at Ohio state winter juniors. This is, this would be 2017. I think. Uh, I watched Kibler go four nineteen, and then 32 minutes later, go nineteen three and win the 50 back yeah. to back 550. What's up? Let's go. Yeah. Exactly. And then for a stroke, I, I mean, I hate to add four. I mean, I would really take those, uh, the three sets that I saw. I mean, I've, I've gotten success out of those three stroke sets from, from that swimming world magazine. I mean, it's just a typical athlete that, that, um, you can, you can vary it up with, with your flyers. It hits the different, the different, uh, training zones that, that, that you're wanting, uh, especially in that two minute set where it's a 150, a hundred, uh, 50 from a push, a 50 from a dive, and a 50 recovery. I think you're hitting uh, different energy systems right there. Um, the all-out sprinter, definitely. The 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 odd ones easy, the even ones fast. I mean, it it definitely can hit a 200 swimmer as well as uh, your lower lower volume swimmers. So, I would take those three sets with me. That's awesome, guys. Last question. Um, and thank you so much for your time. It's been awesome to see you guys and catch up again. We don't get to do it very often, maybe twice a year. Um, the area that you're in is very rich in swimming history. I'm a swim nerd. I'd like to think that, you know, the 200 coaches that have been on this tonight uh, are swim nerds too. Um, can you talk about how you talk about the traditions and some of the history that goes into your program and the athletes who have come out of the area where you are and, and how that plays a role in, in your team culture. Uh, so I guess I'll let Brian go into more of that part. Brian's been around this part and, and, and in his history of his time that he spent at Arden Hills, he, 
he'll know even more of the culture of Sacramento. I, I think from us um, within Davis, it's been our, our culture here is really I've been here 11 years and it's it's been building probably the last seven or eight um, with some of those successful athletes that have come through the last couple of times. And I told somebody this the other day, like it it really is um, culture comes from expectations of kids and, and, and what kids see their uh, their older peers doing. Um, and once we first started, started having kids make national junior teams and to make, uh, you know, national level meets, now the expectations when kids enter my group is that they're going to get to go to those meets too. Um, and so there are, and, and they're, they're going to make national junior teams. And, and 10 years ago, that wasn't a conversation that kids brought up to me and now they bring up to me. So I think now you're, you're, you're using those kids and, and the traditions and, and creating like, you know, hey, this kid made the national junior team. I'm, I'm as good as that kid. I can make that. And so it just becomes that flow and that consistency throughout the program. And and have, like you said, having three kids on, that came out of our program on the national team a year ago, um, they did it together because they all thought they could. You know, oh, so-and-so made it. I can make it. So-and-so made it. I can make it. And I, I do the work with them every day, too. So. I think that's the culture now of, of where people come from in the past. And Brian will know more about the Sacramento history and all the kid, people that have come out of this area. It's, it's amazing what's, what's come out of the, the Sacramento region. It really is because a lot of times when people think California swimming, they think of the coast, you mm-hmm. know, and, and the, the tradition and the history in that central California area is so rich. So Brian, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, being up here, this is my 21st year up in Sacramento. Um, it is when I got up here, um, mainly a lot of the, the talk was about the past. I mean, I took over at a, at Arden Hills, uh, rich in history, gold medals, uh, and so on and so forth. And as well as, you know, I come up here and, um, first, uh, one of the first coaches that, that, uh, actually called me was Jeff Pearson. Uh, he was uh, coaching at Sierra Marlins, and he goes, "I'm glad, glad someone's gonna come up and 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 start start developing uh, more senior swimming." And uh, when I got up here, uh, Jeff was, and may Jeff had the most, and there was mainly one or two other swimmers from uh, other teams that were going to junior nationals, and Jeff was taking kids to senior nationals. So there wasn't a lot of uh, it was Jeff and probably Mike Hastings, mm-hmm. and. Um, and then, then it dropped down to even lower number of junior national swimmers. But I think what was great um, when when I came up here is Jeff, uh, similar to when Bill, uh, when Billy came back from Mobile, but Jeff and I we um, we probably uh, talked on the phone or we or we met a couple times, and we basically had a invisible like rivalry to get our swimmers to go to nationals. You know, uh, who has the most swimmers to go to nationals? It was it was like a internal rivalry, which was great. I mean, he had a he had a ton, man. That 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 guy works so hard, and there's a lot of respect for Jeff Pearson. And you know, he's done he's done a lot uh, when he was here for Sierra Nevada swimming, and he still helps some of the swimmers. But when Billy came on, I mean, we we definitely when Billy came in two thousand nine, and Jeff Jeff had I forgot which year Jeff retired, but when Billy came on, it became myself and Billy. I was at Arden Hill still. Billy's at Davis. And then, you know, we, we had this, you know, how many swimmers can, can we take to juniors? By the time Billy added up his and I added up mine and USA Swimming had their club excellence, just made sense for us to merge. But the culture itself was important so that other teams in our area could develop this, um, the same type of mentality to take and develop swimmers to those bigger meets. I mean, uh, I had national junior team members in the, the 06, 07, Billy. Well, we, we had jun- a lot of junior national swimmers. The year we went and got gold medal, we merged. We were a gold medal team that first uh, summer that we merged, and that was exciting for both of our programs. And to then go to 2016, I think Billy didn't we have like 10, 10 Olympic trial qualifiers uh, for dark swimming in 2016. I mean, who has that coming out of our small LSC? 
I um I remember a moment. I, I don't know if you, you guys will remember this, but San Antonio Summer Juniors, it was one of the last uh, combined Summer Junior meets. And I think this is the meet it was at. But I remember looking over and you, you guys had a lot of final swims. And I was thinking to myself, boy, this program is about to take off. That that was cool to watch that and, and to see it come to fruition. Well, appreciate that. And, and yeah, I think yeah. get back to your earlier, uh, Brian, you, you'll know better the, uh, the um, Olympians, but, you know, Summer Sanders. I mean, just yeah. just like, you know, all the people that have come out of this, uh, Debbie Meyer, um, you know, was in our LSC when I got here and, uh, and the Anderson sisters. Um, yeah. And Brian, you can name all the ones from the past, but it, it's a pretty, pretty amazing legacy of people that have come out of this, uh, this area. Yeah. I mean, Arden Hills, especially, you know, back in the day, just so much history there and, you know, Sherm Gavor and, and you can go on and on about that, that deep history. Unbelievable. Guys. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Recently, uh, Scott Welch coming out of the area. That's oh, yes, right. Scott Welch. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for your time today. This has been so fun. We could stay on for probably two hours and just talk to <laughs> me. <laughs> uh, but how can our how can our people get in touch with you if they have questions? And and Billy, I know you'll send me that link for um, your PDF. And Brian, if you could send me those charts, that would be awesome. I'll put some of them in the, in the show notes, and then people will be able to a access this. Billy, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, my email is swimdavis at yahoo.com. Pretty easy to remember. Um, that's probably the easiest way. I'm not a huge social media guy, so shoot me an email. I'm happy to chat with anybody. Anything. And Brian just has his email over there in the chat, guys, if you want to see that. But, Brian, what's what's another way people can connect with you? Uh, mainly by email. Uh, they can uh, I can send them my, my contact uh, phone number if they want to chat on the phone. Um, you know, pretty easy or, or, you know, where we can set up a zoom or anything else. Fantastic guys. This has been awesome. Uh, I know that I have a lot of new sets that we're going to, we're going to put to use and, and, uh, and test out. And I'm looking forward to sharing those ideas with you. And, uh, I know that hopefully June next year, we'll be on the pool deck together in Omaha and we can chat it up and, and, and maybe grab some great hospitality room. It's the best hospitality room in all of swimming. It's a reason in and of itself to have an <laughs> athlete make Olympic trials. So uh, guys, take care. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate your time. And uh, I look forward to catching up with you guys soon. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks, guys. And remember, I will be selecting uh, one lucky winner for the arena sweatshirt. And you will get